Well, I just want to thank everybody for uh, coming to the PCN Research Update Talks. Uh, we had two speakers today, myself. I'm Louise Marie Dandrand. I'm at the University of Idaho up at the Moscow campus, and I'm a plant pathologist there doing research on uh, Globodera pallida, or the pale cyst nematode. And we also have John Pickup, who will uh, be speaking, and he's from the Scottish government. And uh, I'll introduce him a little bit further uh, as we move along. Um, so I just want to go over a little bit of the background with uh, uh, the potato cyst nematodes in the United States and then talk a little bit about phytosanitary measures and then I'll move on into uh, some, of, uh, some of our research results. And in, in, the, in the U.S. we have uh, both potato cyst nematodes but uh, only one of them in Idaho and that's the pale cyst nematode. The other, the golden nematode, is found uh, only in New York and it was first described there back in 1941. Uh, it's been contained to... Uh, uh, about 5,000 infested acres, and it's found in only eight counties. Um, whereas the pale cyst nematode Globodera pallida here in Idaho, Idaho was first detected in 2006. I think that uh, you probably all heard me say that there's uh, both potato cyst nematode species here are found in the United States. The golden cyst nematode is found in New York, and that was first described back in 1941. It's been uh, contained to just a, a little bit under 6,000 acres, and it's found over eight counties. Um, in New York uh, State. And uh, we would say that the containment effort has been extremely successful. Uh, it's been in the country since the early 40s and has been contained to, to only that state. Um, the pale cyst nematode was first found here in 2006 in Idaho. And the infestation is about 3,047 uh, acres, which is a little bit less than 1% of the acreage, uh, uh, of the total potato acreage in Idaho. Um, there's about uh, an additional 6,493 uh, regulated acres, and those are uh, fields that are in association to the, right, the uh, infested fields. Um, both species are uh, regulated in, in the United States by USDA APHIS and uh, the Idaho State Department of Agriculture as well as NYSDA. I think there are some questions about the impact of uh, potato cyst nematodes and, and uh, uh, they're recognized uh, globally as uh, one of the most important pests of potato. Uh, they do cause uh, stunting, yellowing, and even death of the plants. I have a picture taken here and this is uh, uh, taken by US, USDA ARS quite a, num a number of years ago, but it shows that the uh, the amount of reduction in yield that can happen in infested uh, fields, uh, when fields are infested with uh, potato cyst nematodes. So um, in general, we can re recognize that depending on the density of the nematode, it can cause up to 80% yield loss. So uh, a very significant uh, impact on production. Uh, now I'm gonna turn our attention to Globodera pallida, which is uh, the potato cyst nematode that's found in Idaho. Um, uh, it, uh, it is globally important. It's found uh, pretty much in all potato uh, growing areas, I think ex with the exception of China. Uh, it is a quarantine pest in over 80 countries. Um, and I've already mentioned that it can cause up to 80% yield loss. So uh, most countries do regulate this pest and, and uh, it is recognized as very, uh, probably one of the most important nematodes on potato. I just want to go over the life cycle, just uh, to, to, to go over the biology of the nematode a little bit. Um, in the first slide, we have uh, the, the, the cysts that are, have emerged from uh, inside of the root. The, this nematode is actually a sedentary endoparasite. It migrates inside of the root, forms a feeding site, and uh, develops into a female and remains in that, in that spot for the entirety of its, uh, of its life. Uh, so on, on the left, we have... Uh, the, the cyst on a root, and this was a photo taken by Jen Rowley, who's here in the audience. Um, and then uh, about a cyst is basically the, the body of the dead female, that, and it contains anywhere between 250 to 600 eggs in, in each individual cyst. And the eggs are the infectious unit or the juveniles, as we call them. Um, and here in the middle, I'm showing a slide of some uh, eggs uh, that have been released from the cyst, and they are stained with a fluorescent dye so that we can easily see them under the microscope. Um, eggs hatch in the presence of a host, such as potato, has a very narrow host range, 
mostly uh, uh, plants in the soil species and primarily uh, potato. Um, the potato roots form a, a release a chemical stim stimulus that causes the nematode to hatch. And from there, the nematode will migrate into the root. And you can see the second stage juvenile right here. And that is stained with acid fusion inside of the potato root. It will molt and form a feeding site and molt into, develop into a third stage juvenile and then on into a fourth <coughs> stage, either female or male. And then uh, the female is fertilized and becomes a cyst. So that, in general, is its life cycle. Uh, there's usually only one, uh, uh, one uh, cycle, one generation per year. Um, in, in Idaho, I'm just showing the, the map from uh, the APHIS website here, uh, just to show the, the distribution of the regulated fields. Uh, again, 3,047 uh, acres are now uh, considered infested, uh, just a little bit less than 1% of total potato production. <coughs> uh, there's 9,450 uh, re regulated acres in total. So I think we can ask the, this question, why eradication and containment in Idaho? And I think there's uh, several compelling reasons for that. Uh, first of all, it's a relatively small um, percentage of the acreage is infested. As I mentioned, only 3,000 acres. Um, fields are currently being in, uh, intensively monitored by APHIS uh, to, look, to look for, for cysts and infestation. Uh, I think one of the most important reasons really is that we do not have resistant varieties here in, in uh, suitable for our conditions. Um, there are some, uh, there is some resistance in European varieties, uh, but uh, none available here. Um, I think another consideration is that pota potato is Idaho's uh, signature crop, and there are mar market and trade considerations as well. I think that uh, Kilburn and McGarry have published a, a, a small paper on uh, the economic impact in Idaho of the PCN. And uh, they've reported just for 2012 that there was a $4.4 million loss direct in direct losses. And that, that is quite substantial when you consider it over a 10-year uh, time, time frame. We're talking about $44 million at that time. I'd like to uh, put this slide up because I think, I think the world does recognize that Palata is a problem, uh, much more so in some cases than uh, Globodera stachyensis, and part of that, uh, part of what drives that is the, that there is very little resistance to Globodera pallida compared to <coughs> Globodera stachyensis. Uh, both potato cyst nematodes can persist for a very long time in the soil, although it is recognized that Globodera pallida can survive longer than Globodera rustachiensis. Uh, the eggs are dormant in the cyst. They will just stay uh, inside of the cyst until there is a stimulus released from a host from the potato root that will stimulate it to hatch. So they don't hatch unless the host is present. Um, and I've already mentioned that uh, stable resistance or immunity against the uh, G pallet does not exist in, in russet type potatoes. Uh, so phytosanitary measures, I think, are pretty much designed to minimize the transport and spread of uh, harm, harmful pests. And nematodes are generally recognized as uh, easily transportable in soil, um, and, and they're uh, one of the most highly regulated pests uh, throughout the world. Uh, I think there's legislation in most countries is based on international conventions such as the International Plant Protection uh, Convention, the IPPC, which is under the umbrella of the FAO, uh, which is part of the UN. And uh, the United States has signed on to this treaty, <coughs> as uh, I think I'm not sure how many other countries John, do you happen to know how many countries have signed on? Maybe, well, quite a number. Uh, so next, I want to just talk a little bit about some of the research that I've been uh, doing over the last uh, few years on, on PCN. Uh, we've focused our efforts on uh, using trap crops, uh, using a hatching factor, which is a, the chemical stimulus that causes the eggs to hatch. Uh, biological control agents such as different fungi and bacteria that are parasites of eggs of the nematode, and then uh, biofumigation as well. I just want to show you here, let's see if I can do this. 
just uh, show you the nematode moving inside of a root. Here it's stained with a, a, a fluorescent stain and it has migrated inside of a potato root. Uh, this is a time-lapse uh, photography and it shows it was taken over a 24-hour period and we've collapsed it down to one minute. So it kind of gives you an idea of uh, how slowly it moves actually. But it is a second stage juvenile that's migrating through a potato root and looking for a feeding site. So I'm, I'm going to first introduce uh, Solanum cisimbrifolium, or perhaps some of you have heard of it as lychee tomato. Um, I think uh, lychee tomato does show a lot of potential to control uh, <coughs> the pale cyst nematode, or both potato cyst nematodes actually, because it does induce hatching of the plant. Many solanums will induce uh, hatching of, of uh, Globodera pallida and Rostockiensis, but uh, this particular species does not allow development of, of the nematode. Uh, so the nematode does not, is not able to actually reproduce um, even though it's able to infect this plant. Mm -hmm. So uh, European studies show a 60 to 70% reduction of eggs in one growing season. I've got some data that shows a little bit less of a reduction, but a very, very uh, high reduction in multiplication of, of uh, the nematode in a potato crop after planting lychee tomato. Uh, this is just a host assay where we're looking to make sure that uh, lychee tomato is not a host for Globodera pallida. And uh, the blue line is, uh, uh, number of eggs in a potato crop uh, over a 16 per week period and the red line is um, reproduction in lychee tomato and as you can see we start with initial inoculum of about five eggs per gram of soil and we never build that inoculum up over a 16 week period which means that the nematode is not reproducing in lychee tomato. Uh, these are, this just shows the results of some of our hatching assays and these we do in, in in vitro and in, uh, in little plates where we uh, uh, collect root diffuse it from greenhouse grown potatoes or lychee tomato and then expose eggs to, to this hatching stimulus and count the number of eggs that have hatched. And this gives us an idea of whether or not uh, lychee tomato could actually work as a trap crop as it can only work as a trap crop if it actually in increases or induces hatch of the nematode to reduce the populations. Um, when we expose it to lychee tomato, um, root diffuse it, we get 38% hatch, which is a little bit less than a Desiree root uh, diffuse it. Desiree is a susceptible variety of potato. Uh, in this experiment, what we, uh, what we were doing was uh, looking, to, looking to see what the impact of planting lychee tomato would be on multiplication of the nematode on potato in a subsequent crop. So it's basically kind of thinking of it as a cropping system. So we've done this in the greenhouse where we first plant lychee tomato or expose cysts to a fallow or under a potato cropping system and then uh, leave the cysts in place and come through and plant potato afterwards. So this takes about a year to, to, to go through the full cycle. And we can see that multiplication on potato following a solanum cisimbrifolium or lychee tomato is greatly decreased compared to a potato after potato. So it shows a, a great deal of potential in reducing the nematode <coughs> over time. Uh, some colleagues have also looked at other nematodes. This is some work that Chuck Brown and Inga Sasada have done uh, just to, make, to, to get a, an idea of the range of, of pests that it would actually control and uh, found uh, lychee tomato to be resistant to several root knot nematodes, Meloidogyne chipwoody, uh, Meloidogyne hapla, Pratolenchus penetrans. Uh, so these are, uh, lychee tomato is not a host for these three nematodes. Uh, it's also resistant to Phytophthora infestans or late blight and it's clone 24. Uh, resistant to uh, Colorado potato beetle. Uh, it is resistant to all three uh, nematodes. There is a new uh, Globodera ellingtoni uh, that's been described, uh, I think it was described in 2012, I think it was. Anyway, that's, uh, potato is a host, but it doesn't appear to be um, a, a parasite of potato. Uh, there's Globodera tobaccum also that's um, uh, found in Connecticut. It's also resistant to that, and, as well as Globodera rostachiensis. 
Uh, we've also done some tests with Heterodera species. I think it's probably an Avini uh, group, in the Avini group, but I'm not sure, a serial cyst nematode. And there we found that exposure of uh, Heterodera cyst to solana, cystember folium actually reduced uh, the viability of eggs found in cysts as well as their ability to hatch. And I found that to be pretty interesting. That kind of indicates that uh, since Heterodera does not need a hatching factor like the potato cyst nematode or will respond to different hatching stimulus, this kind of indicates that the lychee tomato actually may uh, produce toxins as well. Uh, we've also been looking at other uh, trap crops, looking at other possibilities other than lychee tomato, partially because uh, we would like the growers to have something that's actually a commercial, uh, commercial crop. Uh, a researcher in uh, Bolivia actually has done some, uh, published on, the, on uh, quinoa, uh, lupinus, uh, uh, ulucus oxalis, and tropelum, and found that they had potential as track crops for uh, Globodera uh, pallida. And so we've just been uh, testing these uh, species to see if there would be um, any potential as track crops. And, uh, Quinoa and tarwi are both uh, grain crops, and quinoa, or quinopodium quinoa, is a gluten-free, uh, high-protein grain crop. It's been cultivated and used uh, by the Inca pe people since 5000 BC, and it's in the same area as uh, the center of origin for Globodera pallida. Uh, tarwi, or lupinus mutabilis, um, is another grain crop and is cultivated in the same area. Um, it's intercropped with potato or used in rotation with potato. Um, some varieties of both of these uh, crops have been sh uh, shown to actually cause hatch of the nematode but not be a host. And so we're repeating some of those studies to see how the Idaho population will respond to those trap crops. And here this is a, a, some results of a hatching assay that we've done. Uh, we selected several different uh, lines of uh, the lupin or tarwi and found that two of them actually induced some, some level of hatch not quite as high as uh, potato, which was at 76%, but uh, much <coughs> higher than what we would see in a bare soil extract, which was only at 10%. So again, some, some potential for a lupin crop to actually uh, cause hatch. We haven't yet had a chance to do a host assay to make sure that it is not a host, but uh, Javier Franco does report that it's not a host, so I assume that he is correct. But we are uh, going to conduct that, those studies this spring. Uh, the other crop that we've looked at, uh, uh, I think this one is Uyuku. Um, uh, two different uh, varieties actually induce some hatch of the nematode, uh, a little bit more than bare soil alone, but again, not as much as potato. So again, these two crops might have potential as a trap crop. Uh, we can move on to quinoa. Here we've uh, gotten some seed from uh, Clark Seeds, which is uh, found in this area. Uh, they've given us three different varieties to test, and we found one of them induced some hatch, again, not as high as potato, but much more than uh, a bare soil extract. Um, what we did find a little puzzling was that when we looked at the, uh, the, the eggs that are remaining uh, in cysts after exposure to these trap crops, we didn't find a significant difference to a bare soil, which might indicate that there was no hatch under greenhouse conditions. So we need to go ahead and test this again. Uh, so for quinoa, a little bit, uh, it's not quite clear whether it can be used as a trap crop. But uh, according to Javier Franco's work, he's, he's indicated that, I think he tested about 10 different varieties and found several that did cause hatch, others produced toxins, and others were neutral, had no effect on the nematode. So I'd like to continue this research and, and uh, include more varieties. And now I wanna talk about the uh, potential of biofumigants to control PCN. I've uh, been working with uh, Dr. Matt Mora at the University of Idaho. Um, he has a long history of, uh, I'm sorry about this. There we go. Long history of working with uh, mustard seed, seed meals, and he's found them to be uh, pretty effective on, uh, against a number of different nematodes. And uh, the way mustard seed meal works is that it, it, uh, it's, it's, it's a byproduct of a, an oil extraction and the oil is, is used either as a biofuel or uh, I think primarily as a biofuel. But the, the meal itself has a residual glucosinol in it um, that when it breaks down forms isothiocyanates. And isothiocyanates are uh, very volatile and they are a fumigant and, and are 
very toxic to a number of different uh, organisms. So we've tested uh, mustard seed meal against this nematode to see the impact on, uh, on uh, the nem nematode. One of the things that um, Matt has done is actually extracted the active component from the seed meal so that he could concentrate it. One of the things that we have experienced in the past with seed meal is that we have to apply about four tons per acre to get an effect. And that is a very high amount of uh, material to be applying on a field. So he has actually developed a process to extract the glucosinolate, and makes a very nice wettable powder, <coughs> very easily applied. And once this is hydrolyzed, once you apply water, that's when you get the breakdown and form the isothiocyanate, which is then toxic. So some of our uh, studies show that it is highly effective uh, against the nematode. When we apply the extract in, uh, under greenhouse conditions, we find that all rates that we've tested, even as low as half a ton per acre, is, kills the nematode. We get uh, no reproduction from that nematode after exposure to the biofumigate. And I want to talk a little bit about some of our field trials. We've uh, been conducting field trials down in uh, southern Idaho the last couple of years. Uh, and partially uh, because of containment issues, we, we do use uh, five-gallon <coughs> buckets as our microplot so that we can keep the nematode in place. Uh, we basically have, uh, for 2015, we had uh, seven treatments, and then 2016, we added quinoa in as one of our treatments. But we have a bare soil treatment, which is just a fallow. Uh, second treatment was lychee tomato to look at the impact of lychee tomato over time on the nematode and as well as uh, multiplication afterwards on potato. Applied a, the biofumigate Brasca Juncia extract. Uh, used a biological control fun fungus called trichoderma. Uh, and then we combined lychee tomato with trichoderma to see if that would uh, maybe increase the effect of lychee tomato. Used another biological control fungus called Plectosferella. Uh, Plectosferella uh, attacks the eggs of the nematode. Uh, and then uh, use a combination of lychee tomato with plectosferella to see again if we could increase the impact of lychee tomato. Um, and then our, our last uh, treatment, only in 2016 though, was uh, quinoa. Uh, this just shows how we put the cysts in, in uh, our buckets, basically t uh, had the cysts in nylon mesh bags, so they were contained uh, in the bucket in a nylon mesh bag. And then we just wired them to um, a stick so that we could pull them out easily, uh, so that we could retrieve them uh, and, and kind of know where they were, keep track of them. Uh, for lychee tomato, we also cut the flowers so that there was no chance of development of seed so that the plant would not escape. At the end of the field trial, we just uh, collected the, seed, the, the cysts and did viable, viability or hatching assays. And this slide right here, this photograph kind of shows uh, what the viability assay would look like. Uh, the, the, the dark blue uh, pick up a stain, and uh, the stain can only be absorbed when the eggshell is permeable, so that means that it is no longer viable. Uh, the white eggs are all viable, and the dark blue are not viable. And this is a way to measure the impact of our different treatments. Uh, we also like to conduct a, a greenhouse bioassay after our treatments, and this again, I really think the gold standard is to look to, uh, to see what the effect of a treatment is on multiplication of the nematode. And the only, only way we can do that here in Idaho is to bring our pots back up to the greenhouses in Moscow and plant potato. So uh, typically a field season is conduct conducted in Idaho Falls, and then we bring our five gallon buckets back to the greenhouses and plant potato to do the bioassay. I just uh, wanted to show you a little bit what uh, lychee tomato root growth looked like, and this is after eight weeks. Um, it, uh, the roots grew very well throughout the, the, the uh, throughout the, our pots, um, so I was pretty glad about that. And uh, let me see, this one is uh, the bioassay for 2015 uh, from our eradication trial. And here I just want to show you again the bioassay is when we have conducted the treatments and we bring the pots up to Moscow and then plant potato on top to look at multiplication of the nematode on potato. It gives us a, a really good, if, a good idea of what the impact of the treatment can be on the nematode. And here, our, our blue line right here is 
control, which is the bare soil. So what happens when uh, we just allow the nematode to sit in soil for 12 weeks and then plant potato on top? And you can see that multiplication is actually quite high. Uh, we got, on average, 600 cis per root ball, so quite a number uh, multiplied on that. Um, and the second uh, bar here shows the effect of lychee tomato. This is the impact of lychee tomato on the subsequent generation of the pale cis nematode on potato. And here we see very, very large decrease in reproduction after a lychee tomato crop. Uh, here we have uh, the biofumigant had less impact than lychee tomato, but it still had some impact, still a reduction in cyst numbers, but not as high as lychee tomato. Uh, here we had trichoderma, our biocontrol agent. Uh, we saw no effect whatsoever from trichoderma from alone. Um, here it is in combination with lychee tomato. Uh, so trichoderma, the fungus, along with lychee tomato, really did not decrease the multiplication of the nematode further than just lychee tomato alone. So there was really no purpose in, in having it there. Uh, this is uh, the second biological control fungus I mentioned, the one that actually attacks the eggs. And here we found quite an impact from uh, applying plectus varella to, to, uh, to, our, to, to um, our microplots. And here's a combination of plectus varella and lychee tomato. So really, uh, what we can conclude from this is that both lychee tomato and plectus varella did reduce uh, the nematode significantly compared to the control. Those were the two treatments that's, that reduced the nematode significantly. So just to summarize, um, our 2015 field trial, uh, we saw an 88% reduction in egg content after the, after the growing season. Uh, but we saw, uh, is that right? I'm sorry, we saw a 25% uh, reduction in e eggs with lychee tomato after the growing season. But we saw an 88% reduction in multiplication of cysts on potato afterwards. So a huge reduction compared to leaving it in a bare soil or a fallow. Um, combined treatment with lychee tomato and either biocontrol agent really made no difference at all. Okay, I just want to really quickly summarize the 2016, I know my time's almost up here, the 2016 data. So we did the same thing for 2016, uh, same, same treatments, but uh, this 2016 we saw 54% reduction in egg content after the growing season compared to the 2015 when we saw a 25% reduction. Quinoa reduced egg content by 55% under fields uh, conditions. So even though our greenhouse and lab was a little bit ambivalent, I do have uh, quite a bit of hope for quinoa. That is a very big uh, egg, egg reduction. Uh, mustard seed meal didn't really uh, decrease egg content, but in hatching assays, that is where we saw the Im impact of uh, the, the mustard seed meal extract where we saw an 86% reduction in hatch of the nematode after exposure to, to the biofumigant. Uh, our bioassay right now for 2016 is ongoing. It's, it's going to go through uh, February, so we'll probably have the results for that in March. Uh, I just want to quickly go over some of what, what I think are the priorities for uh, deployment of lychee tomato in this area for PCN reduction. I think uh, Mike Thornton has done a lot of studies on agronomic uh, characteristics, uh, what we need to do to, to grow lychee tomato here, like how much uh, seed do we plant, when, when do we fertilize, and I think we've got that all pretty well under control. Uh, Pam Hutchinson <coughs> has done uh, several years worth of studies to look at herbicides, and perhaps you heard her talk, but she has some really good, uh, good information there. Uh, we've been working on seed increase and pelleting, and that has been primarily Chuck Brown. And this is probably one area where we would need some work. Uh, we don't have a commercial source of seeds yet. Um, here we've been working a little bit with uh, combining lychee tomato with other um, uh, uh, tools. And really, everything I see, lychee tomato can stand by itself and be a good control measure. I can continue to work with, with this pyramiding, for instance, biofumigates with lychee tomato to, to see if there's a greater impact. There might be some potential there. Uh, again, is there enough seed available? That is one, one place that, that we're working on. Um, and then I think uh, one thing is, is, again, the need for good uh, experiments and uh, the need for a field site to conduct our, our research. And uh, with that, I, I'd like to uh, 
acknowledge that there are many people contributing to this research, uh, that my, my own lab team here, and a number of people, and of course all of our funding uh, sources. And with that, I'm happy to answer questions. So you mentioned the European cultivars, um, but I didn't see any research conducted on that. Is there plans to conduct research on the resistant cultivars that exist currently? Yeah, we've done a little bit of uh, uh, work on that, and uh, I didn't talk about it today because Joe Cool and several people will be talking about resistance tomorrow and the, the work that we're, we've done towards development of that. And I think John Pickup may also address some of that uh, from, from his side, from Scotland. We've done some studies with Innovator, which is highly resistant, and we find that it's resistant to our, our population as well. Any other questions? All right, great, thank you very much. Now I'd like to...